On Sunday mornings, I usually get up and get going before anybody else, and, and a lot of times I have my little worship time, just me and God. And uh, believe it or not, I had a country song in my worship this morning. Thomas Rhett, you know who he is, country singer? He has a new song out called Mammal's House. Anybody heard that? A few of you? I want to tell you, you need to listen to that song. When you see the video for it, you see what I grew up with. But my Aunt Marilyn is Mammal. <laughs> to my kids. And it's a great blessing. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> and that song mentions the Bible. So go listen to it. It'll lift your heart. <laughs> okay. Have you ever been really, 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 really thirsty? I used to get thirsty when we had August football practice in 90 degree weather. Oh man. You know, the, back then they gave us salt pills because we sweated so bad. Uh, I guess they don't do that anymore. I think some of the most thirsty times that I ever experienced is when I, we bailed hay. My family would put up like 40 acres of hay. We had three or four barns we filled with hay. So in the hottest time of the summer, because you got to have dry weather when you bail hay, right? It's got to be hot. We'd get a wagon load of hay and we'd ride the wagon back to the farm uh, barn. And as soon as we got there, we went to the well. <laughs> And we drank water, and it was, it was this kind of drinking. Boom, boom, boom. You ever drink like that? Where you just, you're just going at it so fast and gulping it down. You ever do that? Well, do you do that spiritually? We need to. And there's a fountain free that makes that possible. There's a fountain open for sin. I know this picture isn't real clear, but that's 25V. Anybody driven on 25V to Tennessee? Now, you just got to drive on 25V sometime. Because when you do, you get to go over Clinch Mountain. Anybody been on the top of Clinch Mountain? There's a lookout area there where you can look out and you can see North Carolina and I think Tennessee and Virginia, maybe. A huge lookout there, and there's a veterans memorial there, and there's also a restaurant. So go to that restaurant and tell them I sent you. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful spot on your way to Tazewell. Anybody been to Tazewell? That's the way you go to Cumberland Gap. Have you been through Cumberland Gap? If you haven't, well, go there. You're missing out. But when you're coming down a mountain going towards Tazewell, there's, there's a cliff there and there's a pipe sticking out. There's a pipe sticking out with water running out of it. Living water. That's what they call it, living water, because it's moving. It's not some dead, stagnant pond. It's living water coming out of that pipe. And I've been going down that road, and I've seen people with their gallon jugs standing there getting their water. And it's free. I mean, you just stop there, and you get it. It's, it's free. And the living water that Jesus had to give is living water that can give you abundant life. And it's living water that can set you free from sin. And he is the source of that living water because he's the son of God who died for our sins. This is a fountain in the city of Corinth. You know, all these ancient Roman cities, and cities like Jerusalem had fountains. 
where people could go get water. And the word fountain is used in a way in the scriptures, the Hebrew and the Greek both, for, for, for a well, and it's used for springs coming up. And they had a fountain in Corinth. Here's one. They had another fountain. There's another picture of a fountain area in the ancient city of Corinth that you read about in the, Paul's letter to the Corinthians. But there is a fountain free. In those cities, the water was free. Citizens could just go up and get it. And the water that Jesus has for us is free. One of the Old Testament minor prophets, minor just means little. Isaiah was a major prophet. He had lots of chapters, 60 some chapters, you know. And Zechariah has 14 chapters. So he's a minor prophet. But he wrote during the time period when the Jews came back from Babylonia in captivity, and he, he wrote to encourage them to rebuild the temple. And to get ready for the Messiah coming. That was a big part of his message. Zechariah is one of the most messianic books of the Old Testament. Messianic means prophecies about a king who's going to come, who's going to bring righteousness and peace, and his name is going to be Wonderful Counselor, Prince of, Prince of Peace. You know that. And the Gospels in the New Testament quote or allude to as many or more passages from Zechariah as from any other prophet. Did you know that? I mean, they quote a lot from Isaiah, but they quote a lot from Zechariah. And Zechariah, by the way, wrote, you know, almost 500 years before Jesus was even born. So you have prophecies about Jesus that are in this amazing Old Testament prophet that, that talk about things that would happen in the life of Christ hundreds of years before he's born? That just makes my spine tingle. How about yours? <laughs> it's exciting. Zechariah prophesied about Jesus. He prophesied that God would dwell in our midst. He prophesied that God's servant, that that he called the branch with a capital B, would be a priest. Jesus is that branch, that netzer, Hebrew word, the, the Nazarene, which is a word connected to it. He is the branch who would be our priest. And the branch would be not only a priest, but he would be a king, which was un impossible under Old Testament law. Because priests came from the tribe of Levi, and kings came from the tribe of Judah, right? The king or Messiah would someday come riding into Jerusalem on a donkey's colt. Can you imagine? As a victor, and he would be praised, and he would bring righteousness and, and peace. That's what Zechariah chapter 9 prophesied. And the, this Lord would save his flock Jesus often talked about his flock, especially in John chapter 10. He would be betrayed by a friend and sold for 30 pieces of silver. Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, and he was supposedly Jesus' friend and kissed him on his cheek in the Garden of Gethsemane as Jesus was arrested, right? The money that Judas took, that money was prophesied by Zachariah, Zachariah to be taken and to, to, to purchase the potter's field, which basically was the dump where the potters threw their broken pottery. And Zechariah prophesied that his body would be pierced. And it was as he was nailed to the cross and as the spear pierced his side. And Zechariah prophesied that God's shepherd would be smitten and the sheep would be scattered. And that's what happened when Jesus was taken and tried and crucified. The disciples ran. Aren't these amazing prophecies? 
Aren't they amazing? Written hundreds of years before Jesus was even born? If you're not a Christian, please look at the evidence for the inspiration of the Bible such as this. Give it a close, hard look at what God has done for you. And then there's a passage in Zechariah. that a lot of commentators say is a passage about the Messiah. But in the 13th chapter, Zechariah wrote this. In that day, and when the prophets made the statement, in that day, often they were speaking about the day when the Messiah comes. In that day is often a prepositional phrase used by the Old Testament prophets when they're speaking about the Christ, the Messiah. In that day, a fountain will be opened for the house of David and for the inhabitants of Jerusalem, for sin and impurity. A fountain for sin. It will come about in that day, declares the Lord of hosts, that I will cut off the names of the idols from the land, (laughs) and they will no longer be remembered. And I will also remove the prophets and the unclean spirit from the land. You know, just think about this. When people became Christians, they left their idolatry like a Corinth, and they came to Jesus Christ, didn't they? And in Jesus Christ and in his kingdom, there are no idols. (laughs) Well, I got some backup on this text. You know, I've heard preachers preach that from Zechariah 13 when I was a kid. But David Limbaugh in his book, Finding Jesus in the Old Testament, says this. In this book, Zechariah, Christ is portrayed as the cleansing fountain and Savior of Israel whose blood covers the sin and uncleanness of the people. That's what David Limbaugh said. And then there's Homer Haley, one of my favorite commentators on the Old Testament. I love to hear him teach on the prophets when I was younger. And... He has several commentaries. His commentary on the Minor Prophets is one of the best that you could ever have in your possession to help you learn more about the Minor Prophets. But he used to be a professor at Abilene Christian University and was a professor at Florida College. But listen to this. In the piercing of him unto whom they looked, a fountain was opened to all the people for sin and uncleanness. A fountain suggests an abundant provision for the forgiveness of sins. Homer Haley says this is a messianic text. And the piercing of him comes from the previous chapter, chapter 12 in Zechariah. And so, there is a fountain And just like that fountain on Clinch Mountain, it's free. It's free. We didn't earn it. We can't buy it. It's free. And the question is, are you thirsty? (laughs) I hope that you're just wanting to gulp it down (laughs) because it's abundant life that that living water gives you. Thank you, Father in heaven, for this awesome provision for the sin problem. The Lord's Supper is a time to give thanks for a fountain for sin, a fountain that is free to all who embrace it. Thank you.